saw that. Some kind of fucking flying fucking fruit bat or something. Just like, this is I started press record and something came in out of left field and just pow, nailed me in the eye. Oh, what the friggin' hell, like, what, because you've got the lights on, the bright lights, because it's pitch black here. I don't know what it was, but like a, looked like a, a good two ouncer came out of the darkness and boom, absolutely. Anyway, I lived, right? That's all that matters, so. <laughs> still, still here. Attack, attack by an English bitch. But I lived. Yeah, that's the kind of guy I am. Okay, let's do this thing. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. Neil, pick up the fat lab with you in the mother-fluffing house. And I'm joined by a very, very familiar face. He is a man who has an incredible aura surrounding him as he was born. Were you born? He certainly lives in in Brisbane, which right now has become a thing. It's a thing, Ryan. Brisbane is a thing. The centre of manliness. T-shirts being printed. Back pressure world records being being set. It's Ryan Blue Bowen, ladies and gentlemen. Ryan, it's been so long, mate. We've only done like a couple of shows today. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I think I went to bed at like one o'clock or whatever it was uh, after we finished the six. And you know how I've got one of those brains that if there's something on my mind, I just it just doesn't let me sleep. So I've had I've had about I've had about an hour of sleep. I reckon. Oh, that's the worst so, in it as well. When you can't, when you're just tossing and turning. Oh. I just I just gave up on it too last night. Like I, I tried to go to sleep and then I was like, no, screw this. Get up and do something. Uh, and, and for me, writing an email was like the, the thing that was, it was a business development thing that was on my mind, and I, and I just I just had to I had to do the task. I couldn't put it off till the next day, and um, I just had to get up and do the task. And I did, and then and then eventually I fell asleep. But that was at about five a.m. So, so. <laughs> so th- 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 this is. Um... It's quite an unusual one, really, way in some respects, because the Deep Inside series, uh, obviously I've been involved with a great deal of shows with you, but I don't think, as far as I'm aware, that we've done a Deep Inside series with you where we go a little bit and we dig a little bit more into your background. Now, I think we did do something very similar to that uh, on the World Arm Wrestling League This Week podcast, the WL This Week podcast, a few years ago. Um, so... Some of the people may be familiar with them from stuff you've done on your own channel and bits of things you've done probably on Jake's channel, on the Aussie Arm Wrestler. Get over to the Aussie Arm Wrestler, check him out. Check him out, ladies and gents. Um, and, and you might see some stuff on there also. So I'm, I'm sure there's a few people there that have got a degree of familiarity with you and with your beginnings in that. But I did want to, for those people who haven't, just start there a little bit and sort of, if, if nothing else, give a bit of a whistle-stop tour of you, who you are, yeah. how you got into the sport, uh, and, you, and your background prior to arm wrestling, mate. So where you came from, if you will. So where's the best place to yeah. start? Where would you like to pick it up, Brian, in that respect? Honestly, I, I'll give the, I'll give the, the fast version of it, but I've, I've been an arm wrestler since day one. And when I say day one, I'm talking, talking as a child. Um, I, didn't, I, I obviously took a long time to discover the sport because it, it, there was no professional arm wrestling here in Australia as, as we know it now. And, um, and it took until I was aged, uh, 28 to, to discover the international world of professional arm wrestling. So, but everything prior to that, I was always an arm wrestler. I was, I was always going to be an arm wrestler. Um, uh, when I eventually did find arm wrestling, all my school friends, all my, everyone went, oh yeah, that makes sense that Ryan has gone to professional arm wrestling. And, and I say that because I loved it as a kid. I, I was one of those kids who, um, was kind of but stronger than it looked. Uh, and it always used to, uh, I never, I, no one at school would beat me. My, the only, the only person I knew that could beat me as growing up was my old man. And, uh, we had the, we had the bet. Uh, when I was 12 years old, I made a bet with my dad on my, on my 18th birthday, I'd be able to beat him in an arm wrestle. And, uh, um, at about age 17, six months, I started training what I thought was relevant to arm wrestling and I, you know how on the old bench press flat bench press there's, there used to be a, a leg on the end of those bench press machines mm-hmm. like home gym. I used to sit there and use, put my elbow on the bench press and, and uh, raw side pressure um, with, the, with the leg extension just to try to 
uh, big dad. But on the 18th birthday, dad beat me. Um, <laughs> I lost a bit. Um, but it's safe to say I've loved Arm McLean forever. And, were, were you sort of one of the guys that came from the old over the top influx? Were you the per- was no. that your sort of first? I mean, I, I was born in 1985, so um, I, I don't I don't recall my dad ever mentioning over the top. I don't think mm-hmm. he even necessarily knew of it. I, he was like, I asked him, but I don't remember that movie until until I again I discovered um, the world of professional arm wrestling. So, but for me, it was just a case of uh, I loved arm wrestling, but then it was a matter of how I was going to find it and discover it. And what that, what was your earliest memory of it, Brian? What's the early? What's the first time you can ever remember seeing arm wrestling as a sport? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's very distinctive. It was, um, I'm going to get my years right. 2013, um, I lost an arm wrestle. I, I was, I owned and ran a supplement store and I, I lost an arm wrestle to my, uh, wholesale manufacturer, uh, and, um, when he delivered the product, he beat me and I said to him, mate, I'm going to beat you next month. And I, I looked up on the internet arm wrestling techniques because I wanted to beat this guy next month. And, uh, and I saw the world of professional arm wrestling and, and instantly it was like, this is it. I found, <laughs> I found my sporting destiny finally. Um, because I tried in other pursuits, I tried tennis, it got reasonably high in that. But, um, uh, yeah, the moment there was, there was never a shadow of doubt. I, I I'd never touched an arm wrestling hand in my life in you know, professional sense. But as soon as I saw that there was an Australian Arm Wrestling Federation and that there was a World Arm Wrestling Federation and all these other uh, professional leagues, it was it was a guarantee in my head that that was what I was going to do. And mm-hmm. I haven't stopped since. So. Um, when you first came into the sport and you started to look this up, I know obviously that there were other people in the country that had already sort of been that route. Um mm-hmm. Sam Safuri was the first guy that you sort of saw on the international scene, or that I did. Uh, and Neil Bell was another guy that had been out and about and, you know, got heavily involved. Lovely boat, Neil, as well. Um, if you're listening, Neil, how are you doing, brother? Nice guy. But um, when you first came in, I think you were the first person that sort of had the, the, the I'm going to say, balls to go out there and really put your face out as someone who was in pursuit of um, something special from Australia. Yeah, you know? yeah, that was that was something that, that, that really tied into the fact that I I straight away dreamed of it being a career. Um, that was, for me, my childhood dream, was to just be a professional sports person and to, to be able to call any sport my true career. Like I said, I did try in tennis. Um, as a kid, I, I, I put my my entire life energy into becoming a professional tennis player. And I did well as a junior. I won national titles as a junior and was ranked quite high. But um, I never made the transition from junior through to, to adult tennis. And, um, and so when I discovered arm wrestling, it was the same thing. It was a second chance for me. It was that opportunity to say, okay, uh, you haven't missed the boat. One of the, one of the key factors is I discovered that Particularly, uh, it seems that the average age of world champions and world elite seem to be in their 40s. When I, on my first observation, yeah. uh, I was looking at names like Jobs and Banks, of course. Uh, I was seeing, um, people like even Richard Lofty, uh, and, I, and, and Todd Hutchins, uh, Tim Bresnan. I was seeing all these people that were at the top, but they weren't spring chicken. And, um, and I thought, wow, okay. I, I'm 28 years old at the time. I haven't missed the boat and went all in. So, um, it was, it was, it was good in that sense that, uh, that when I went all in, um, it, it not only, not only did I go all in the arm, but I really wanted to make it a career. And it was that side of it that led me to, to start thinking about how I was going to, um, make that happen. Because when I, when I analyzed the sport, I didn't see enough prize money in there. Um, to really call it a career unless you really were number one and even then still it was probably not enough. Um, so I thought to myself, well, okay, how do we do that? I, I owned a supplement for the time and I, I started spending every single second that I wasn't serving a customer um, thinking about building a, an arm wrestling brand. 
and building an arm wrestling club and building an online presence around talking about arm wrestling. And so right from the beginning when I was even the absolute novice on day one, I was I started the journey of being a content creator as well. Um, and, and it's still going on it, and it has become my career now. So, um, so I, I feel pretty honored and privileged to be honest to be, to be here as a content creator and who can call it a career now. It's, um, yeah, it's pretty special. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful, mate. And good, good for you. It's a really great thing. It must have been a, a really, where was the sort of point and at what point were you just walk us through where you were in your life when you thought, okay, <clears throat> this is it. I'm going in. I'm going all in, and I'm gonna I'm gonna become effectively a professional arm wrestler or YouTube creator, whatever yeah. you want to call yourself. You know, for me, yeah, well, you are a professional arm wrestler because you are making money from arm wrestling. Mm. There's kind of two moments where I went all in. There's the there's the all in moment where it still wasn't paying, but I just put I went all in on my energy. And then there's the all in moment where I transitioned from other paid vocations um, to just being all in on the arm wrestling. And the first, the first, the first one I referred to was just when, when I made that decision in my supplement store. And it kind of, when I reflect on it now, it's kind of, um, it's all the cliches about being successful and anything. It's really what it was. It, uh, I, I, I like to sort of quote that I did four and a half years of content where no one was watching. Uh, my YouTube revenue in the first four and a half years combined was like $34. Um, and, and I was pretty happy with that. I used to watch the stats. I used to watch it make one cent a month and think, okay, next month, come on, let's push for two cents a month. And, and I'd celebrate that little victory. Uh, and it was going and on from there. And make my first dollar in a month was amazing. And things like that. Um, so I, I went all in in that early sense in, in a way that I, uh, every, every waking moment, would fit into the category of recreation. I dedicated to Armisen content mm-hmm. and Armisen training. Um, I still obviously had to work at that point, but every single moment. And where I was in life at that point, I just got out of the military. Um, I had a pretty severe back injury in the military. Um, I had, was in a parachuting accident and saw the L4, L5 disc. And, and I really uh, atrophied down. I, I was always a, a strong athlete, um, but that back injury really set me back and there's, there's, there's some photos you can find out there if you dig around on the internet of what, it, what some people see as my start point and it's um, in the sport and it's tremendously weak looking. It's really bad uh, but I was, that was me at the bottom of uh, a year and a half of not being able to move essentially yeah. the back injury. Um, yeah, so I just got out of the army. I had, um, I, had uh, I had a three-year-old daughter and a, and a uh, Newborn son and um, running a business, and, and that was when I went all in on, on everything. I, I said every single hour that wasn't considered work or family time or as necessary um, time for family, and that was, was dedicated to right, let's build this. And then um, it was 2000, 2000, 2017, 2018 that it became evidence to me that it was going to become a career and uh, uh, I, I, I'd been through such a big process of content building where I would create vlogs every day uh, and everything that I did arm wrestling uh, literally I vlogged every single day called it the daily arm wrestling that led to Travis agent calling me in December of 2017 uh, I've never spoken to Travis in my life I've never spoken to a North American great in my life at that point um, anyway, Travis called me. I remember, I remember being all nervous to answer the phone. I'm like, holy, oh, <laughs> Travis, I can call me here. And, um, this is, this is Christmas Day in Australia. And, uh, I had a chat with Travis and, and he said to me that he was hosting a tournament in Arizona and that he wanted me to, um, he wanted me to promote it for him. I said, why on earth do you want me to promote them? He said, because every time I open up Facebook, all I see is your content and your efforts, and you obviously know what you're doing. So um, I want to fly you to Arizona, and I want you to help me promote this event. And um, so naturally, I, I said, yes, I will absolutely do that. And uh, over the next couple of weeks, Travis was organizing where I was going to be staying, and, 
and he just jokes around it. Look, even John Brzezinka's down the road, and um, you could possibly stay with him. And then he just quickly took it back and said, no, of course you can't. You can't stay with a goat. Don't be ridiculous. Um, but that, that stayed in my mind, and, I, and, and uh, five or six days later, I, I messaged John. Again, never having spoken to John in my life, so I messaged John, um, explained why I was coming to Arizona and I was, I was helping Travis and uh, whatnot, and that I was looking for a place to stay. And John so graciously and generously uh, offered his home. Um, John and Renee offered their home to, to me for the entire week that I was there. And uh, yeah, what 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 came of that was the long story short. But it, en- it ended up being that um, John jumped on a podcast with me for, for six months straight as a as a co-host, where we just talked about the the goings on of the Armistice world that week. And um, that really was the true big catalyst to the channel taking off and me getting credibility as an arm wrestler, as an arm wrestling content creator. And, um, yeah, that was when I went all in on the career, I would say. And what kind of difference did it make <clears throat> just in pure sort of numbers, yeah, subscribers well, to the channel, mate? Did, where did you go from and to? I always like, I always like Talk about that moment in two senses. I like to talk about it in in, in the sense you just described, but also as the arm wrestler. Um, the first, uh, in terms of the subscribers, I was at about I think two thousand, three thousand subscribers mm-hmm. uh, when I met. And over that next six months, it probably went from three thousand up to ten thousand during that time. Um, just having John on the channel. Obviously, John is John hadn't been seen in any sort of media sense for about two years. Uh, I think his WAL 2015 was kind of his last public really appearance. And uh, he, he, uh, when, I, when, I, when I actually got to John's place, I asked him, if, uh, in my mind I was thinking, if I could get one interview with John, it would be amazing. Um, and actually uh, on about day three of staying at John's place, I asked him if he'd be up for an interview. And he said, no thanks. He said uh, um, that, to be honest, I've got nothing to say to the arm wrestling world and uh, the interview questions are always the same and I'm just uh, not up for it. And, um, and I let it, go, let it go and thought, yeah, no worries, I respect that and it's just good to be here anyway. And, um, and it was right at the end of the state, John, that I was sitting there uh, filming a wrap-up of the NAL tournament and John, John was behind the camera just watching me and he, he was quite surprised. He's, and, and how naturally it all flowed and how easy it was for me to uh, do this wrap up and he asked me, um, what is this, what is this thing you're doing? And, uh, and when I just, then over six beers and six hours later, uh, John was all in. But John, John, one of the most special things about John, uh, was that he's never let me paint a cent. I call it a career and still to this day, John won't let me paint a cent, um, for anything he's done in terms of the impact. And, and his impact is substantial. Um, the amount of subscribers that came on, the amount of people that all of a sudden gave me credibility as a, as a content creator. Because at the time, I wasn't yet enough ranked athlete to, to rest on the back of that. Um, so I really was a content creator before I was an athlete in the international sense. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and a, a lot of people, I've had a lot of people message me and thank me for bringing John back to the world of arm wrestling. Because, uh, like I said, he'd been out for a good year and a half, two years, and no one had seen him. And so, all of a sudden, the Armbrusten world for a six month period had John, John talking every week, which was a lot of fun. So, um, yeah, and John, John's now become one of my best, best friends. He's, he's invited to my wedding and things like that this year. And if COVID allows it, he'll, he'll make it out. So, um, yeah, I, I can't, I can't thank John enough for how much of an impact he had on that career side of things. Like, yeah. And it speaks volumes for him that, that um, John is as every man as he really is. Such yeah. an approachable guy. It's funny, he always, um, <clears throat> I remember reading a book, one of my childhood heroes was uh, Muhammad Ali. I remember reading a, a book about him and uh, one of the comments in there from uh, the person who was contributing was something along the lines of uh, people would come and they'd, you know, wait outside for a, a glimpse of him coming out of the house or coming out of the out of his property. And said, and the funny thing was, if they knew him, they would have known that he literally could have walked up to the front door, knocked on the door, and he'd invite you in for a, a coffee and a chat because he just loved to speak to people. That's what he liked to do. 
And yeah. it's funny, isn't it? John's uh, pretty similar to that. He's very approachable, you know, to a yeah. lot of people and always has been. He considers himself one of the fold, you know what I mean? He's like just an arm wrestler, even though he's so much more um, yeah. for, the, for the people that are that are outside looking in. But mm. uh, credit to the guy. That, that uh, do, Were you always very relaxed around him or did, were you a little bit... Oh. A little bit starstruck initially. Starstruck initially. I remember remember arriving at um, Phoenix Airport and self talking to myself, going, "Ryan, it's just a man. Don't don't whatever you do, don't act like a fan. Just act and treat him, treat him as another man." And and I think I came across not as a fan, um, but inside it was like, "This is this is John to thank." <laughs> <laughs> it's just picking you up from the airport. It was a crazy moment for, for an arm wrestler, um, as it would be for any anyone in my position at that time. Um, sure. it was a, yeah, it was, it, was, it was very crazy. But like I said, it's turned into a friendship and like one of the most significant things. Um, uh, I talked about this the other day. I, the other day I did a lift in the gym where uh, the presence of Lachlan Adair fired me up to beat a PR. And I was very surprised that I beat a PR bit here. And I was like looking at the psychology of it. And it made me remember having John in my corner at my WAL um, debut. Yep. And uh, the, the effect of that, the effect of that John has had on my arm return, but he, just his mere presence in my corner, the psychology of that, I don't think I could have lost that day. I think it was impossible to lose that day with John. <laughs> and John didn't even need to. John didn't even need to give me any specific instructions. Just him giving me the nod, like, yep, don't worry, you got this, was, was the probably most empowering thing that I could have as a, as a debutant in the, in the WAL at that moment. So, um, yeah, John, John's impact uh, is, is being profound a lot across many spectrums, even uh, like I said, as an arm wrestler, um, not only in the WAL debut, but uh, he shaped me, obviously, just getting to grip up with John at that stage as an arm wrestler back in 2017. And, um, yeah, to, to grip up with John and to be guided by John um, really did uh, lead me down a, a really good path because um, John, or the, the strategy that I ended up using against Alan Guerra was one that John had, had taught me uh, to actually combat Dan Tesh. You know, I know that we, laugh, we, we, laugh, we laugh, often laugh and talk about how impossible Danny is to beat, but for me, <laughs> for me, Danny was that enigma that, that I couldn't beat. And um, John, John looked at my matches with him and said, "You need, you need to transition from the top role to a press. You need to do a pass. You need to commit. You need to be brave. You need, you need to, to back it." And I, I spent months doing that, preparing for Danny, and it ended up being what I did for Alan Bear. Um, so John, John shaped a lot of my armor. He identified gaps and weaknesses and told me where I needed to mm-hmm. get those positions. And I, I, yeah, I've gone and done all that. And, and the funny thing stuff. is, people won't know, <clears throat> you didn't necessarily have the smoothest ride in the approach to the WWL debut because for those mm-hmm. of us that were there and sort of watched how that unfolded, it's fair to say that you were having some issues the day before. I mean, when we were in the the restaurant <laughs> outside the venue, and you suddenly went like you started to try and eat again after the after the weight cut and making weight, and you yeah. went white as a sheet, and you were <laughs> you were yeah. bless you you were in a bad place, mate, for a while there. Yeah, I was, uh, quite a shade of pale, and I thought this dude ain't <laughs> he's in good place. <laughs> you 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 were really rough, weren't you, for a bit? Oh, yeah. It was terribly rough. It was um, I I I, I mismanaged my weight cut, I mismanaged my rehydration process, uh, trying new things. But and um, and and it yeah, something about the something about that combination of of cutting weight and trying to force glycogen back into my body and that mm-hmm. just set me off. As you saw it, you were sitting there having lunch with me. I think it, I think I ordered a steak and chips, and I ate a quarter of a chip. They so literally were, ate nothing. I, I was <coughs> I was a little bit worried for you. I'm not going to lie. Uh, yeah. I think I said to you in the restaurant. I said, "Are you all right, mate? You you've gone what?" And you because you hadn't spoken at yeah. that point. And I thought he's he ain't good. And you just went just grey. You know when you see somebody just the colour just fade. 
And I thought, he's in trouble. He's going down here. But, um, yeah, to your credit, you did pull it back. But it also, it's a massive journey, isn't it? I mean, Australia yeah. over there. How long did that take you to get there? Oh, so, Brisbane, Brisbane to, to LA is not so bad. It's like a 14 hour flight, but at least it's, it's, there's no, there's no stops anywhere. Okay. So, that's less than I thought to be. The, the, the time difference is always a, a struggle, no matter, no matter what it takes. It normally takes two or three days to get adjusted to the time difference. So, um, it, it, it was an impact for sure, but yeah, six the day before, it took me about eight hours before I was, after that, that lunchtime meal. It was about eight hours later that I was ready to eat again, and then I felt good again. And I thought, yeah, now we're we're, we're on for tomorrow. So I wish. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was uh, a worrying time, mate. But what do you think has been the most pivotal moment for you in terms of defining your career or changing perception? You know, there's a lot of joke. We take the we take the mick on the fix and so on about. You know the most hated guy in the sport, and all like this, and chasing for the title from uh, the uh, from Michael Todd, who's in the ascendancy now in the popularity stakes. But outside of that sort of uh, joking and, and mucking around, it's fair to say that you do have um, or have built yourself, forged yourself a certain degree of uh, fans and reputation. I don't think anybody would deny that you're a good puller, that you're a serious. Yeah. Wrestler. For me, what was know, the, the defining moment, mate? The, the defining moment, um, again, I, I feel like I've really opened up a new chapter in the last 12 months. Um, it's interesting that I stayed in the last 12 months because I haven't competed in the last 12 months um, due to COVID uh, and for obvious reasons. It's just the world hasn't been open. But I actually feel like I've really had a defining year. Um, um, and I feel that just within my elbow, within my hand and wrist, it just, I'm convinced within myself and I'm, I'm a big person on self-belief. Um, I've always been someone who can see a long way into my own future and believe it to be true. I don't, I don't doubt what I see five years from now at all. Um, and, and what I see in five years from now is exciting to me and it's, and it's one of the reasons why I've rubbed people the wrong way. Uh, throughout my entire journey because I always uh, back what I see uh, a long way out and, I, and I'm willing to verbalise it and, and for me I think my arm is at a point now where I think I could win a world title in the next couple of months legitimately whether it was a WAP world title a Zloty, world, a Zloty championship I think I could beat Rob Vigent in the next 12 months but wherever it may fall I feel I just feel like my strength is alive and um, I've had that. I've had a lot of great uh, make mention from you before that I arm wrestle really well, and I just need to get strong. I've had Engen Kersey say that to me. I've had Devin Larris say that to me. I've had John say that to me. Um, had a bunch of people yourself have, have given me compliments in that regard. Um, are you are you I'm, aware of it, Ryan? Do you do you understand why those comments are coming? Because it's not. Um, it's not just blowing smoke at you. You can clearly see your mm. evolution as an arm wrestler, and you, and you are very well rounded. Do you sort of uh, are you aware of that progression, and are, are you aware that do you, do you sort of because you've told me in the past you don't you didn't necessarily initially think you were at a level where you could do that, and now you you really feel you are. So that suggests that you've seen a genuine progression in terms of your roundedness and the the strength that you've got in those areas. Um, is that very recent, or is that sort of a, a year old, eighteen months old? Where, where are we at? It, it, it is. It, it is very recent. Um, uh, I've always been a, a student of the sport in the sense that I I started the sport not in a physically particularly strong sense. Even though I had natural propensity towards the strength of arm wrestling, I wasn't someone uh, who came in strong. So. I started and, and I've always studied the sport heavily to try to always um, win despite being the the less the lesser man in the strength team. So I've always known that my arm wrestling ability has been good. I've always been the people that I've been bound to right from when I was a novice were always stronger than me, and uh, my execution has always been my focus. Um, and I always said to myself that 
uh, just be patient. The strength will come. I know the strength will come and the conditioning will come. Um, mm-hmm. Like I said, I've, I've had some pretty decent victories um, in the past, but this last 12 months, I feel like my game is finally ready. And, I, and as you mentioned, the, the conditioning, I feel like there is a well-roundedness now that, that I used to have vulnerabilities in certain certain directions off the off, off center, where now I think that something's changed in my elbow this year. That, for instance, I'm no longer in need of the strap. I used to be a strap puller. I used to have to get to the strap. I used to have to get my get to my position. Now I'm willing to award to people that look and feel stronger than me without the strap, and that's a big transition for me. Um, that that I'm, I can now hunt people uh, and go for the kill, regardless. And the, and, and the self belief that that's given me um, in a physical sense, I just it's totally uh, opened up the world for, or possibility for me. Um, it it really changed the way I feel. But I honestly feel like my strength at the moment is so clearly at the best it's ever been. And um, so yeah, I, I don't fear anyone in the world that's my weight at the moment. There are people and, that and I... And where do you see your optimum now, mate? Because it's fair to say you're a little bit bigger or have been a little mm. bit bigger I, through COVID. Yeah, I'm 95, 95 kilos right now sitting here this morning. Um, uh, and I could, I feel like I can still, if I was to pull a WAL, I would have no drama getting to the 200 pounds. Um, but at the same time, my strongest right now, I, I feel like uh, I, I feel like I could compete at a you know two twenty pound class and kind of eat up to that and um, and be mega uh, and and I, and I feel like I would I feel like I'd be fine against the top tier two twenty guys. And when I say I'm fine, I'm saying competitive with, yep. with that weight class um, at the elite level. I feel like I'm there. So when I think about like lotted to weight division eighty six kilos or ninety five. I'm, I'm leaning towards, more towards 95 than I am towards 86 because, uh, I, I don't like to do massive cuts. Um, my, my body composition is improving. I'm getting leaner. Like this time last year, when I went to his body, or when I went to his body since 2019, I walked into that plane, uh, having cut two kilos to make 95, but it was a much softer version of me. And now I'm 95 and, um, much less body fat on me and uh, much, much stronger this year than I was 12 months prior. So I feel like my, I feel like I've got another two or three years where I could make WAL middleweight uh, or that 90 kilo bracket for a WAP World Championship or something like that. Um, And then moving forward from there, it'll probably be embraced 100 kilo, 220 pound category and maybe 15 years from now, I'll be super heavy. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the most difficult things that people have struggled with a little bit <clears throat> is they obviously don't share your confidence in where you're at. And it's been difficult to <clears throat> get a, a viable measure on that because for, for not through want of trying, you are obviously a little bit isolated down under. Um, and there isn't the recognised names there isn't the recognised high level arm wrestlers that you would see. Let's say, for example, if you were based in Eastern Europe, you've got a lot better access to those people. You know what I mean? Oop, I thought you'd locked up there. Yeah, it's okay. You're back. Yeah. Did you did you catch all that, Ryan? I I, I, I got. I didn't catch it. No, I, I lost. Okay, gonna, gonna, I yeah, go, we'll go again. I thought you'd locked up just at the end. <clears throat> yeah. I think one of the peop- one of the things that people have struggled with is the fact that you are in in many people's eyes relatively untested. You've been tested mm. to a level, um, but that level is not the elite world level because you're quite mm-hmm. isolated down in in Australia. You don't have the access yeah. to the uh, the names, the prominent names that are out there, and there's a lot of that. You know, th- there are names that are out there and the, the known arm wrestlers. And there's another crop of arm wrestlers that may be extremely good, but people aren't aware of that. So they're not given that kudos. They're not given that credibility. 
Um, yeah. What are the what are the things that you draw upon for your own confidence? What would give you an indication of to, to make a statement like you know I believe that I could beat Rob Vigent in a in a year? Um, mm. Are you saying a year from now you feel like you would be able to, or if you were to go into as soon as you get a shot, do you think you are competitive with someone like Rob now? Yeah. I, I think I think I'm competitive right now against Rob Vigent. Um, and a year from now, yeah, for sure, even more so. Um, the reason I feel that is without having had any confidence, it's just what I feel within my arm at the table with, with prison proof, what I feel <clears> within my arm when I, I pick up the weight. And there's been a distinct change in the last 12 months where, like I said, a lot of it comes down to my outer strap pulling, but I have, I have gone from having to take something off people to beat them in the club to just letting they can do anything now and I can just I can I can just sit and hold guys that this time last year I could not sit and hold. No yeah. way. And they've progressed as well. They've been active, not as nowhere near as much as I have, but they've been active. So they I'm sure these guys haven't gone backwards. And now the entire Brisbane club, with the exception of Lachlan and Jordan, who are equally progressing, um, yeah, I, I can do things now that my elbow just had no chance of doing this time last year. And, uh, so it's sort of an awareness of how much you have left in the tank in, mm-hmm. in these kind well, of encounters. It's, it's, it's giving you the confidence. I can arm wrestle guys now, and I, I can use zero form to arm wrestle. I, like I said, I don't have to deny their hand. Uh, I don't have to do anything. I can just, my, my finger containment and my elbow side pressure, those two components alone can stonewall 98% of people in my club if I choose mm. to. Which, like I said, a year ago, nowhere near that. Nowhere just near to be that. clear, for the ladies and gentlemen watching the show, this club is in Brisbane. <laughs> yeah, 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 we know it's one of the, <laughs> it's one of the best. <laughs> Love the Brisbane club, man. But not joking aside, I think that do you sort of identify with that angle? That, that uh, does it frustrate you that people aren't giving you that credibility when you feel it so strongly within yourself? Or it doesn't, it, it doesn't because there's, there's no reason for me to to have it any other way right now, given that I haven't done anything since. Um, my last international was was a body test 2019. So, it, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's to be expected. People see myself training with Lawson all the time, and Lawson and I are progressing at very similar rates. And, uh, and I, I I always put my um, <coughs> I always put my my uh, money behind Lawson as well, saying that I truly believe he's going to the elite level. But because we're doing it together, it, 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 it doesn't. No, there's no evidence to confirm to the international audience that, that anything has changed. Both Lachlan and I feel like we're locked in a cage where when we're let out of it, people will go, wow, okay, I didn't think you were at that level. Mm-hmm. Like, and I honestly feel like that's going to happen. And, and, I, and we're patient. We'll, we'll, we'll bide our time and wait for our opportunity. But um, I feel like I can win uh, performance now at the international standard um, that I just I, I, I couldn't last year. And, and Do I you feel that your before. style is better suited for North American arm wrestlers rather than the Europeans? Because you've spoken I, I, about, uh, and, and so I, many I, people I, have spoken about the stylistic difference in arm wrestling. I say, um, <clears throat> the, the Ryan Bowen that we saw at the WAL was very much a super match puller um, when it came to international standards. But um, my goal is not to be a super match guy. It's not to be exclusively a North American style puller. Mm-hmm. I, I want to be, my, my overall goal is to be one of the all time greats in the sport. And for me to achieve that, I need to, I need to be able to put the sword to people in a WAF environment, in a volume environment, whatever, as well as a super match environment. And so when I, when I got my body experience, I really came away from there identifying, uh, that, uh, a strict, Strict start, out of strap, offensive game was lacking for me. And that has been my focus for the last, well, uh, almost 15 months. And mm-hmm. 
if you look at my last super match, which which was against a guy that previously I would have got into a defensive battle with, uh, I, ha- I now have a different set of tools available to me. So I, I don't think that I'm more suited to North America now. I think I've I think I've evolved. Um, when it, when when you look at my novice, <coughs> I was I, I actually started not as a defensive armor, so I started very much as an offensive armor, and um, so I think that that's always been in me. When when I look back at my childhood as a tennis player, as a junior, I had the fastest serve in junior tennis. Um, I, I I without any training, knowing how to, without knowing how to throw a javelin, I I I, I went and qualified for nationals. And, javelin, things like that. So there's an explosivity in my arm that has always been there um, that I think I actually taught myself out of that because I studied Devin Larratt so much and became a defensive arm wrestler. And, yep. and because I was targeting the WAL as an opportunity and I wanted to be that super match puller, I I deliberately built myself into a defensive arm wrestler. But Zvody has reminded me that defensive arm wrestling is not what's going to win tournaments. Um, so, well, it, it, it is and it isn't, isn't it? I mean, yeah. I know you've been heavily criticised for that, and, and you could say the same about Devon, that he pulls on the counter. But one mm-hmm. thing that, that defensive arm wrestling, that defensive style does make you do, is arm wrestle fundamentally well, and in a, in a well-rounded manner. Which, yeah. let's be honest, is never a bad thing, because it's like anything else, it's a game of building layers on layers. Yeah, and if, you can, yeah. if you've got an awareness of that and then you can build that layer on and you've got the ability to do that, when you look at yourself as an arm wrestler, are, do you see any areas of your game which you think are detrimental to you being able to achieve that ultimate objective of being a recognised uh, world number one at the weight? There's, there's nothing within my genetics or physicality that I think is a, is a, is a hurdle that a real problem. I think that I get the world title uh, in, in the years ahead. Um, my conditioning, I, I feel like I have a full spectrum of conditioning available to me. Um, there's no injury that I'm really having to work around that's going to be a problem. The, for instance, I, I would say uh, about three months ago, I contacted Jerry Cataret. Yep. Um, I contacted Jerry because I consider him to be the best swap presser uh, in the world, even though Jerry will, okay. will come out. He doesn't he actually doesn't want to flop press? He just, but he will go there if he has to. And I talked to Jerry and I said, Jerry, the reason I'm, I've come to you is because it's the final frontier in my conditioning. Um, I feel like I am conditioned everywhere else and can call on every other position and be rock strong. But if I need to call on a flop press, I don't feel like I'm rock strong yet. Um, so there's only for me that is the last component to conditioning my body. Um, to then be ultimately where I wanted to, to, where I've always been aiming. And I've always been aiming to be like John Bazank. I've, I've modeled myself on him more than, than anyone ultimately. And I, I, I picked John not for just the obvious reason of him being the goat, but my elbow to finger just makes me the same as John. And so when I study how, how to beat any given style, um, I watch how John does it. And, uh, and, and I, and I know that John, John had a press. He certainly had a flop press if he needed to. Um, just squat, just stopping you there one second, mate. Have you broken that down further when you talk about fingertip to elbow? Have you looked at the ratio between how much of that is hand, how much of yeah. the hand is palm, we are, how much is forearm? We are spot on the same. In terms of length, we are the same. Wrist is the same. Fingertips the same. Hand span the same. The only difference is John's hand is thicker than mine, considerably yeah. thicker. But, but in terms can't... of all the, the sort of specifics of length of fingers, size of palm, um, how much is arm, you've gone all through all that and it's identical. Yeah, and, and we're, we're at the same height as well. Where yep. I'm just short of 6'2", John I think he is 6'2", so he's, there's a quarter of an inch difference in height between us. Um, it's just that everything's thicker on John, um, which which obviously has a factor, but uh, but in terms of the directions of of, of the direction for counter-attacking any given style, um, yeah, I'm, I'm blessed that I happen to have the same dimensions as John, so I can 
and, and there's no shortage of footage of John countering every style there is out there. So it, it's a yeah. great, great place to study. Um, and yeah, so the plot press for me is, is the final frontier, but even without it, I'm excited because I, I feel like I can still achieve uh, the vast majority of things to achieve without a plot press. Uh, mm-hmm. there's, there's, only a, there's only a handful of situations where I really need it. Um, and I can, I can, I think I can draw on a plot press at about 80% of the rest of my threat level. Yep. So I need to gap somewhat. I need to gap down to 80% before I can really you know, hit that plot press. But I can hit a shoulder roll inside my, my, my hand for, 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 for full force now. I, I, I would, if, if technically that was the right move, if the way my opponent was setting up was presenting a weakness against the shoulder roll, then I would mm-hmm. shoulder right from the gut. Yeah, fascinating stuff. So, yeah. in so, in terms of sort of putting a timeline on that, do you put your own timelines on things? So, you, obviously, you, you made it very clear that you believe and that you feel like you can be world number one. In your mind, have you got a, okay, I've got a clock and this is when I'm going to do it by? And this is that important to you? Or are you not really, it's just a relentless yeah. pursuit of? Yeah. It's, it's one of those things where I feel, um, it, it's not, it's not, not clearly identifiable. They're, they're, when I say I feel I can be world number one, I'm not saying right now. I'm saying I can be in genuine matches with anyone, but it's unlikely that I'm world number one. I'm not saying I'm world number one yet, but I feel like, um, let's say Rob Vigginson. I feel with Rob that I could have a real genuine match and it could go anywhere. Um, mm-hmm. But when I think of names like Rustam Babayev, who... Uh, Kitagali on Garbayev, or um, Zaloyev, or Sasha Andreev, there's, there's names of that sort of caliber that sit at that 95 kilo weight. Um, I, I do feel I have the game that I can counter, technically counter all of their styles. Um, and I do believe I'm developing the conditioning to do it. Uh, yeah. I feel like three years from now, uh, I'm in the conversation with all of those guys as to who wins the match. And when I say three years from now, I'm talking, the, I, I feel like that, that's how long it'll take before I'm genuinely there and the opinions of the armor of the world will be who wins, Ryan or anyone. Yeah, like it'd, be, it'd be a, it'd be a, a toss up conversation that you hear at that level. <laughs> yeah. That's just the <laughs> way um, And when I say three years, that sits all right with me. It doesn't sound in my head that doesn't feel too ambitious and it doesn't feel too conservative. I'm yeah. probably going to be wrong one way or the other. Uh, I'll do my best to make it wrong in the, in that I was got there quicker sense. But I, if it goes the other way, it doesn't bother me. And that's one of the things that um, the haters of the um, wrestling world, particularly towards me, miss in me. They don't, they don't recognize and see that I'm really it's not coming from a place of arrogance. It's coming from a place of self-belief. And it's one of those things I, I don't fear the process. Uh, I actually, I, I, I ridiculously enjoy the process of, of walking down the path that I can already see in my mind. Um, and I've done that from the beginning as I climbed through state and national ranks entering international. <coughs> yeah, I think so, actually, you, you're very strong in that respect. You certainly don't, being around you personally, I've never felt that there is any arrogance or intimidation. I don't think you are intimidated by a loss at all. I don't yeah. think you're narcissistic or arrogant. I think you've got a massive amount of belief, and I think you really, really want to do it. And yeah. That's what I personally felt to you when I spoke to you. And I can under I I I don't uh, I don't disagree with Hayden because. From a very limited perspective, if you only see bits and pieces of me, you see someone who isn't there yet who says they're going to. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and any time you see that, you, it's fair enough that there's a good percentage of people that are just going to disagree. Sure. Um, but the people that know me well, um, like yourself and, um, and, and anyone who's close to me, anyone who's met me, um, see more of the reality of it and, and they go, oh, yeah, okay. And it, it, it's, um, 
it, it feels to me inevitable because I, and, and the reason I say it's inevitable is because I love the process so much. And I genuinely, I know I'm a lifer for arm wrestling and, and I just can't imagine under any circumstance someone who loves the sport as much as I do and who, who, who trains as much as I do, studies as much as I do. I, I just, it doesn't seem possible that you don't keep progressing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't hold anything against the haters who, who think that it's a joke, who think that my ambition's crazy. Um, I, 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 I've accepted them as part of the, the ecosystem that is the, the world I live in as an arm wrestler. And, um, and yeah... <laughs> But a lot of them do become fans in the end, so it's all good. <laughs> now, you spoke about <clears throat> your desire to, uh, in pursuit of becoming the world number one, you wanted to get out there and sort of um, build the layer on layer, and you spoke about going to try and develop a press, getting tutelage from Jerry Cataret, which is both admirable and sensible in many ways if you're looking to master that technique. Do you think that there are other steps that could enhance your game and also, perhaps your PR and credibility rating, if you were to step more into the European yeah. side of things. I'm yeah. talking about, you've got a familiarity recently with people like Krasimir Kostadinov, you know, who himself is surrounded by killers in Sasha Andreev, Bojidar, all the guys, you know, the guys of that ilk. Um, Engin Terzi may be another one. Uh, there, there, there are a number of guys around Eastern Europe who you have access to that you could yeah. potentially get out, train with when COVID-19 um, is behind us. Is that a plan? Or 100%. is that just a... You've nailed exactly my thought process and where I want to go next. Um, I've had a, I've had extensive exposure to North American armor and that has led to me being here. But very much so, I, I desire the exposure to the European side of armor. Particular, particularly Eastern European, I would love to go and train with Krasny, go and train with England, go and compete in uh, Ukrainian nationals or something like that. Just go and go to Kazakhstan and train with them. Mm-hmm. They all, these are all things I that, that I, I not oh only God. want to do. Like, when, like, I, I would have done those things this year. They were, they were the things I, I would have done um, if I was able to travel. Like that I am blessed as a, as a career and part, as part of the career I can I can book a, a flight to anywhere in the world and, and go and arm it. So I have the ability and the, the, the luxury is almost better than anyone else out there to to build a, the most efficient step ladder up to this process. And yet yeah. you know that the next most efficient step ladder for me is to, is to get that experience from that, that region of the world. And yeah, without a doubt, that I, I have Without a doubt, I would love to go there. And, and because of the, the network that I have, it, it isn't hard to get, get there either. So, yeah, Krasnick, of course, the Dino, I've um, spent a fair bit of time talking to and, and uh, receiving direct advice from him on how to evolve my game. Um, the Latvians have had a big influence on, uh, on not so much directly me, but via Lachlan, they've had some influence. Um, but, and you, you mentioned Engen as well. I've, I've started talking a lot with Engen in the last month. And, and yeah, um, undoubtedly when the, the, uh, the COVID restrictions ease out of Australia, you'll see me in that region of the world. And you'll see me, um, yeah, compete. I'll, I'll undoubtedly book myself a super match with, with someone and then yeah. train with a bunch of killers as well. Tremendous, mate. Right, we're at about 55 minutes into this interview. It probably wraps up uh, the first session. Uh, I want to say thanks very much, mate, for coming on. Pleasure as always. And I think it's been quite interesting, and hopefully your fans and your doubters learn a little bit more about you, mate. Window on your soul. And this won't be the last, ladies and gents, that we've got uh, from Ryan. Just starting to warm up a little bit. What I would like you guys out there to do is send messages over to Ryan. Uh, send messages over to me. Let us know what you'd like, what questions you would like him to take on in the next part of this series, and we will address them. We'll get st- stuck into those um, and answer what I think you. Uh, I think you've probably realised he's not shy about answering questions. Pretty much an open book. <laughs> <laughs> what gets so, you in trouble? What gets you in trouble is that 
I, I, I truly, I truly say what I feel and, and, and that is often what leads to, yeah, trouble. But, <laughs> but I live, I live my truth, so what can you say? <laughs> and you look like you're enjoying it, mate. You look like you're enjoying doing that and everybody's enjoying watching. So, uh, yeah, put the questions out there, guys. Remember to get over to see more from Ryan. Go over, check out Ryan Blue Bowen's channel. You'll find him all over social media. OG YouTuber. <laughs> TikTok and the rest. Get over there, check it out. If you want a pair of sunglasses, this is your mother fluffer right here. <laughs> you got Thank shades you on. Sun. You could cue cue the bad boys. Get them shades on. Have you got them there with you? Arm wrestler. There right. you go. There's, on the side there, there's a little arm wrestler metal inscription. There you go, pound for pound on there as well. Lovely dance. <laughs> Ladies and gents, this has been Ryan Blue Bowen in focus on the Deep Inside series. This is your first time to the Supernatural Strength Channel. Please like, share, subscribe. Until we see you here next time, take it easy, peeps. What grabs your eyes on that, if anything?